Hi, everybody. Welcome to Sierra Club Airport Marina Group and our monthly membership meeting. We wish to remind everybody that the Sierra Club Airport Marina Group is the regional group of the Sierra Club LA chapter mandated with jurisdiction over the geographical territory, including the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. And our purview is consistent with the Sierra Club mission. For 30 years, the Airport Marina Group is working to preserve and protect the Biona wetlands, ensure that do no harm conservation principles are respected, take action against threats to the environment, as well as threats to the public health, safety, and well being of the 700,000 residents living above and in close proximity to the Biona Wetlands Ecological Reserve. Uh, we're so pleased to have you join us this evening to hear David McNeil's presentation on extending the Baldwin Hills Conservancy to the ocean. And David has invited Shona Ganguly to participate in this presentation. First, for everybody to know this meeting is being recorded. I'd like now to... Uh, introduce you to David McNeil, who is the executive officer of the Baldwin Hills Conservancy. And uh, I point you towards the uh, bio that we did on the announcement campaign. So thank you, uh, David and Shona, for being here. And with that, I'll turn this over to you and take it away. Fantastic, thank you very much, Richard, uh, Jeanette, and all the folks at Airport Marina Sierra Club who have joined the call. I see names popping up, and I was participating last, last meeting when Margot did her presentation, so I saw your faces then, but today I'm gonna look at the screen and not see a lot of faces, but um, Richard did a good introduction talking about what Durancy does. Um, we are a public agency and we do a lot of work in the Baldwin Hills and a lot of it is focused on uh, improvements and expansion. So with that, the airport, and I wanna actually thank Shona, who's gonna be my right arm or my eyes because uh, she's controlling this, the screen. And, uh, and as, as, as a good support entity, as uh, the Nature Conservancy is, I'm lucky to have her supporting not only this presentation, but ultimately supporting uh, the Baldwin Hills Conservancy and its efforts in Sacramento. So, Airport Marina, Sierra Club's March 19th meeting. We're going to overview of the Conservancy, which is going to be mostly my part talking about the work we've done without trying to be over, uh, whatever, over, uh, over enthusiastic and or bragging about the work we do. Uh, key projects in, completed in the territory as well as um, stewardship and wildlife interpretation, which are key parts of what we do as a small agency or more intimate agency in terms of local. Um, and then uh, Sean is going to take over on the investing in urban uh, conservation component. And then there's going to be information about the BHC expansion language um, and climate resiliency funding. And these are two items that certainly um, I can talk about in terms of, you know, content. Um, but the, the advocacy piece comes from uh, the folks of the Nature Conservancy. So with that, we'll go on to the next slide. I, I always like to bring up history. Um, this is the Baldwin Hills as it was way back uh, in the early days. Um, I think this is pre uh, 37 or 36. Um, you got oil derricks way in the background. You've got the Heinz 57 uh sign up in front and then you've got a whole bunch of land where Culver City was and and then La Cienega is that little street that runs past the 57 sign but it wasn't really a through fair thoroughfare and then to your left that other street is La Brea running up to the top of the hill where you see a kind of a star um above and it's got the um uh, the five points intersection of Stalker, La, La Brea and Overhill um, this is all pre-development. I do like to go down memory lane and think about what it used to be prior, but there was oil drilling going on back even back then. Next slide, please. Um, we have uh, some of the development that's been increased in the Baldwin Hills. You can see now in this aerial, the top area of the aerial has the oil fields starting to um, get scarred up uh, from their, their movement. You have the uh, Eastern Ridge Line and the dam at the top right corner. 
Um, and La Brea, once again, hitting that one, um, it looks kind of like a starfish in the corner um, that has all those intersections meeting. And then Baldwin Hills, Baldwin Vista, Culver City, West LA College, uh, and other areas beginning to expand uh, in the area. And they're, they're even drawing in the middle of, of the track homes for uh, the Ladera Heights development um, back then. Next, please. So the Conservancy was created in 2000. Um, it uh, was born essentially on the 2001, the same year that my son was born. So we are effectively 18 years old and graduating from high school. <laughs> um, the uh, the long-term uh, mission is to acquire and develop uh, public lands. Um, it is our overarching goal to expand Kenneth Hahn State Recreation Area into a two square mile park, uh, larger than Golden Gate Park um, in San Francisco. Um, all of that includes restoring, protecting habitat, a lot of the things that you guys uh, talk about in your mission uh, in terms of dealing with uh, educational and recreational experiences on public land. Uh, we have a board uh, as a state agency. We report to a board of um, 21 members. Um, they have good representation from state, county, and local agencies, as well as adjacent neighborhoods, which is pretty unique. Uh, for our agency and, and as, as we carry forth all of our interest is trying to make sure we have a lot of ground up information from neighborhood groups and interested parties um, that are at the table, not a, a, you know, a, a plethora, but definitely representation in our voice. Uh, our jurisdiction is non-legatory and when they said the Baldwin Hills Conservancy is coming to your town, I remember when we started this, 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 this effort in 2000 um, and we had some folks in Culver City that were afraid that we were going to condemn houses because they were in the territory along the Bayona Creek. And uh, we had to try and calm everybody down and say, we are non-jurisdictionary, non-regulatory. We don't even own land, generally speaking. We are strictly investment. So to, to remove us is, is not to protect yourselves from being bought or developed. You're, it, you're basically protecting yourself from having any investment to improve your quality of life or the environment in your just an adjacent area. So. Um, the key is we're not coming into ED or change in his lives. Local control is the most important thing. Conservation planning interpretation are our forte. That's what we do in our main wheelhouse. Next slide, please. Um, all of that was you know, wrapped up into the goals of, of the master plan, which I talked about as being larger than Golden Gate Park um, and larger than Central Park in terms of the, the, the original plan for 1,500 acres. Um, this is an illustration done by Mia Lair and Associates. Uh, it has water features. It has a land bridge that goes over La Cienega, which runs through the middle of this drawing. Um, it has um, a lot of habitat. The original idea was one third uh, passive recreation, one third cultural, and one third um, active recreation. And the passive really included a lot of habitat and opportunities to restore areas. Uh, and then provide access to those areas and some recreational facilities as well as cultural facilities. <laughs> next, please. I zoom in on the next slide and it, and it has uh, information about access because access is a big part of what we do. Um, you know, when you have, you know, three million uh, plus people living in, the, in a close range of uh, the only regional park, uh, making sure people can get there is important and serving Californians because uh, this does have regional significance in the county, but it also has uh, statewide significance because of the population of Southern California being so huge. So um, access along the routes, we kind of map out the bike paths as well as the bus routes, um, the inter 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 interchange with regards to the, uh, the MTA and the Metro Rail. Um, and there's also a big movement afoot for transit to parks to make sure people who don't have cars have access to the resources that all of us who do have cars do uh, have to have. So walkability, bikeability, uh, reducing the carbon footprint, uh, getting people on public transportation, which is the transportation to parks program that the county is working on. All of those things are really integrated into our planning efforts uh, and making sure access and equity is, is, is taken care of. And you can see Bona Creek has its lines extending down from the Baldwin Hills along the left-hand side uh, along the creek with the yellow boundaries as well as the uh, the markings for trails and, uh, and, and, and transportation. All right, next slide. 
this is our acquisition map. Um, we talked about 30% increase in public lands. Um, the, the next slide, which is probably coming up soon, there it is, um, should, it shows you the, the, the key areas. She's got two slides going. But either way, it shows the increase. That's fine. It shows the increase of the access of, of open space that was acquired. Um, you know, our first bond was $40 million, and uh, we were able to acquire Stocker Corridor, um, as well as the Eastern La Brea Greenbelt, as well as um, some areas south of uh, the green, the, the kind of mint looking green area above the ballparks. A lot of investment into acquisition of land uh, during that opportunity was taken so we could develop it into park land or at least preserve some of the land. Basically, if the park is going to be built out to uh, 1,300 acres, um, we are at the 750 acre mark now. Next slide. So this kind of shows the progress. The middle area is the hatched area, which is basically a, an easement that we're gonna be exercising portion by portion, which is the middle of the oil field, but some of the unobstructed areas we'll be working on acquiring. But long-term acquisitions have been increasing, uh, but things have gotten quiet, you know, oh, during this, these, these weird times, but more importantly, um, you know, the push and pull with land ownership, real estate needs, oil, um, as well as um, housing uh, have become a big issue with regards to acquisitions in the Baldwin Hills. And, um, and it's always going to be a tough haul, but we're in it for the long haul. Next, please. The uh, historic Baldwin Hills to the Pacific. It, there's a historic connection. This is an old map that I borrowed from our friends at the uh, Rivers, uh, uh, downtown at the River Center. Uh, Santa Monica Mountains. Um, it, it basically shows um, the LA River down the main corridor of everything, um, as well as all the tributaries that were uh, just naturally done during the major flooding times uh, as they run southwest across the basin, uh, past the Baldwin Hills, which is that little patch in the middle, and then out to the, the, the what we know as Maria del Rey. Or, uh, that is the you know old system of swamps uh, and, and drainage that went all the way down, as well as um, the LA River and its, its tributaries to the Sentinel Creek um, from the Bionic Creek, and, it's, and, 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 and of course, um, along the Dunigas Channel areas now. All of this was the natural areas, um, and these are all the areas we've lost, uh, but it kind of shows that we have been connected. The hills have always been connected to the creek. Next, please. In terms of habitat, you know, we've done a survey, and we get an, there's been an update on the survey, but people are surprised to know that there's, you know, major habitat value in the Baldwin Hills, unique to the region um, in terms of being surrounded by urban areas. It certainly mimics what we see um, in several areas, whether it's Santa Monica Mountains or um, out on the coastal wetlands or uh, other areas. It doesn't have the uh, El Segundo Blue, which would have been nice. Um, or, or any other habitat uh, species that are rare or hard to find. Um, but we're very happy to have you know, a lot of different species, including the burrowing owl and others that, uh, that make up the diverse or biodiversity in the Baldwin Hills that we work really hard uh, with, with our, uh, our researchers uh, that we work with on our, I'll show you the uh, slides in the coming, uh, that we work for bio studies, um, the biodiversity studies that uh, are being done, as well as the citizen science. But overall, you can see coastal sage scrub dominant, um, as well as native grasslands and certainly riparian areas with some native trees. Uh, and then, of course, a lot of invasive. But a lot of what work we do is trying to restore areas back to a, a, a native state as possible, working with uh, our scientists. Next slide, we have the Park to Playa Trail, which is a big major infrastructure project. Uh, about six years in the planning in terms of implementation and, and, and funding, but certainly it was uttered a long time before the conservancy started, maybe 1999 um, by the folks. Uh, Terry Tamden was one of the first I heard about it. Um, he was with Environment Now and the idea of having a, a trail that runs from the parklands out to the beach uh, is, is a great idea. Um, certainly we adopted it and kept that dream alive um, and carried it through two administrations from uh, the Governor Davis to Governor Schwarzenegger to um, Governor Brown and now it's coming to full realization under our new leader Gavin Newsom. Um, it, it, I like to say sometimes ply at a park because sometimes it's June gloom at the uh, beach and you want to come to the park and get to the highlands and see some fresh air and, and, and get some sun. 
but ultimately it is an 11 uh, mile contiguous trail that runs from the Baldwin Hills out to Bonner Creek and, uh, and it uses all the infrastructure there to get people there on bicycle and or foot. Next slide, please. Um, it was built in segments or prioritized in segments. Those are all complete except for one part, which is the bridge we'll get to in the future. Um, but the seven segments, you know, about $25 million investment in terms of uh, building out the trails and shoring up uh, uh, hillsides and, and doing all the infrastructure necessary to have the trail be put to life. That does not include acquisitions that took place uh, to make sure the land was available. So all of these undertakings are big investments of, of public dollars, particularly uh, the bonds that have come through, whether it's Prop 40, uh, Prop uh, 84, Prop 1, Prop 68, um, all of them have had a hand in trying to build this. And the Conservancy has been very smart, and we'll see later on, in terms of leveraging its funding with local resources, because state doesn't look at state money as a match. They look at state and county, state and federal as matches. Um, let's see. The trail is you know, 11 miles contiguous. It, it, it basically includes um, areas to rest and learn and, 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 and interpretive sites along the way. Next slide, please. The main uh, the centerpiece right now that's in completion stages is the bridge. Um, that was an invested uh, investment area that I, I, I run down the numbers here. Uh, the VHC put in 3.9, um, the, uh, the open state should put in 600,000. Measure M is, that's a typo and I fixed it, but I couldn't get my computer up and that's why I have emergency support from, 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 from Shona. Um, but it was $5 million in for measure in for the transportation piece. Um, anyway, a total of $10 million to get this bridge completed, uh, which is the great divide between the eastern and the western ridge lines. Um, there is a car bridge there now um, that you can see on the lower end, uh, but that is not a pedestrian area as well. The, when you landed on the opposite side of that bridge, you could not go onto the land because the landowner was a private landowner and they said, yeah, even though it appraised at uh, $3 million, uh, we want $8 million for the land because we know we have you where we want you. And the reality is we can eminent domain because we don't take land and none of the bond money is allowed to take land. Um, so we just moved the bridge down and made a pedestrian bridge, which will also have a habitat feature as well to, uh, for crossing for smaller uh, smaller vertebrae and, and, and birds and certainly uh, butterflies that can move across. Um, so there's a lay down work area on the western, on the eastern side in Kenny Hawn, which will cross over La Cienega behind the Blair Hills into uh, the, the Park to Playa Trail, which will pick up and take us to Stone Dune Nature Center. Uh, next slide, please. So in this drawing, um, you can see La Cienega Boulevard, you can see Kenneth Hawn. Uh, you can see the plans for uh, putting tree buffers between the housing as well as uh, the trail as it comes across. Um, they're going to actually have some art locations um, in there for public art, um, but the bridge is a, is, a, is a very long bridge. I think it's 440 uh, linear feet uh, to cross La Cienega with four different pieces. Next slide, please. Um, not to scale. So you can see this is the aerial of the bridge. Um, and it shows the planter, so to speak, or the, the, the little habitat feature along the the, the walkway, so the pedestrians are in the middle and the habitat feature is on the side. The bridge will be open at night, so any larger um, uh, native, or native, from skunks to, to raccoons to coyotes will be able to cross, um, but the smaller lizards and, and the like would be able to use the planter and feel safe and make their way across uh, during the day or at night or at their leisure. Um, but that's the goal is to try and make, uh, you know, one of the first wildlife quote unquote crossings that's, that's available to connect the two ridge lines, which do have habitat that cannot get across uh, La Cienega. Next slide, please. So some more renderings. Um, all of Park to Ply is uh, pet friendly, meaning on a dog leash you can cross. Um, you can cross the bridge on a dog leash, with a dog leash, all the way through the county parks, and they've made exceptions as well on the park to fly sections of Baldwin Hill Scenic Overlook as well as Culver City Park. Um, so dogs on leash is the rule, but you know, uh, it's accommodating world and we'll work through anything that comes of that. All right, next slide, please. 
One second, we have a quick question about if there'll be a video camera on the bridge to view wildlife crossings. You know, we've done video game cameras uh, in a few of our studies with the Loyola Marymount University, and I'm sure I'll be able to get um, our friend Eric Strauss to drag a camera out from time to time and do some pictures just for just for habitat value because we're always updating our bio and you know biodiversity aspects and you know, any movement across the bridge would be interesting to see who's using it and others will be able to use it for their future research as well. I'm very happy to have this component. Certainly it was an argument to make sure it stayed in because every time you change the budget, it was like, well, we're taking out the habitat corner and we had to fight for it. I hope it looks and, it, and functions in, in, a, in, a, in a way that, that makes everybody satisfied or at least feels some satisfaction. Um, but it's, it's ultimately a, a, an opportunity that was put to life and we'll have our own on this side of town. Next. Stoneview Nature Center is the landing place from that bridge. Um, if you haven't been, it's a nice five acre park uh, that has a lot of features. It really focuses on healthy living, healthy lifestyle, uh, has uh, raised beds, um, does gardening uh, classes, um, allows for fruit tree picking because they have uh, about 11 different uh, types of fruit trees on the site, um, all with cultural significance relative to California's history. We made sure from the oranges, to the avocados. The only thing that was only not that was out of California's realm was the fig tree, but they figured out a way to tie that in. There's also a, a Native American uh, area for, for, for herbs and, and the like. So it's a really, it really is a good nod to culture. It's a good nod to native landscaping. It's also a great nod to watershed protection. Um, a lot of the features of the building are built to deal with capturing water and recharging. Um, there is a, a lot of, um, uh, the, the solar power is there generating about 40% of the, the needed power in the, in the facility during the good season. Um, and, and a lot of things they use to, to teach people about, you know, how to become a more sustainable steward in this uh, California, particularly with regards to uh, water conservation. Next slide, please. So there's a question that, about if there'll be irrig irrigation in the planters. And I don't know, Deborah, if that's the question about the previous um, bridge or about the Stoneview Center? It is about the bridge and yes the contractor has worked out irrigation and drainage in some way shape or form so I don't think there'll be a hand watering issue um, um, on, on this um, but uh, they do have uh, a system uh, that I, I believe does include um, some if not temporary irrigation permanent irrigation uh, if they use PVC, it will become permanent, obviously, because you know it's not built forever, but it's long built long enough to establish the plants, and it has a tendency to stay around. Um, but ultimately, uh, the irrigation has been considered, so the plant life will survive. Um, okay, so the the site that we're showing you now is the former school site that was that is now where Stoneview Nature Center is, right behind Blair Hills, the neighborhood behind you on Stoneview Drive. Uh, the five acre site had school buildings, as you can see on it, as some bungalows and a parking lot um, and a lot of pavement, of course. Um, the next slide will show you um, the design aspects that we considered after surveying the site and looking at the fault lines as well as uh, oil drilling history. We found that the building location that they had the school on was the most troublesome of all um, in terms of it had a, 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 a uh, an old well underneath it uh, that it hadn't been abandoned properly and, and the, the building had asbestos in the ceiling and and the bricks had arsenic so the building was uh, was definitely trashed and then in terms of seismology uh, they found that the corner where the parking lot was next to the uh, former soccer field was which was open space at the time for them was the best most structurally uh, sound area to put the site so the new footprint is in the far right corner with the small community building and and and, and kitchen um, as the, the raised beds and everything like that are all in that corner um, and it's it's a very successful implementation of a project that is very dear to my heart next uh, slide so why threw in these shelf slides of the construction well it, you know it's a work in progress when it was um, we do have an office there that we, if we ever get to go back to our offices, um, but you can see some of the, next slide please, some of the, uh, the elements that were built um, in terms of uh, the trees that were planted. If you go there now, it's fully grown in. The raised beds are being built over to your right, as you can see, and, and, and multiple features for outdoor, you know, just walking in the garden are there, as well as exercise nodes. 
Uh, the next slide basically shows, you know, I think maybe six months after it was open. Next slide. Um, and how the native plants have grown in. Um, but now they just added more trees and more trees and more trees. And it's really a, a good um, uh, a place to location to land. I think I saw a picture on the bridge being soundproofed. Um, the bridge will be closed at night for pedestrian traffic. Um, it will not be covered enclosed uh, other than the fencing on the sides. Um, uh, the noisiest thing on that area is La Cienega. So I don't anticipate the bridge causing too many problems in terms of audible. Next slide is um, uh, once you leave, since we're kind of on the park to fly drawing journey, we've left, the, we've crossed the bridge, we've gone to Stoneview, and then if you keep going behind Stoneview, you'll end up with the Baldwin Hill Scenic Overlook, which has been around since, oh my goodness, it's been 2000, I think 2009 now, 2008. Um, and uh, is a st great success in terms of facility and, and certainly the stairs are a popular destination. Next slide, please. I'm gonna start moving a little faster because I wanna make sure someone has time. The Milton Green Street project is another project that we implemented um, that's further down the creek. So we jump out of the Baldwin Hills and we head down the creek to Milton Street, which is right next to Delray Middle School. Um, we did the Green Street as well as the Parkway. Um, the Green Street features a lot of important pieces. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. It has uh, the drawings and the renderings, you know, which has always progressed. Uh, but the idea was to cut curbs, uh, insert trees, planters, um, and provide uh, shade and, and cooler streets as well. Next slide, please. So the completion, it was opened, I think, four years ago. Um, it is the street itself is managed by LA Bureau of Sanitation in, in Bonin's, um, the Councilman Bonin's um, district. Um, they've done a pretty good job of taking responsibility. It's the only green street this side of the, of the 110, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and the goal of the goal of the street is to take the water to the sides, which would uh, end up in the flows, would be ending up in the planters along the sides, all the vegetative. Uh, storm curb extensions uh, are available to recharge as well. So any runoff coming from back from the school and the streets beyond come down this area and flow towards the creek. And instead of going into the sewer system or into the creek, they are channeled into these areas. So yes, it does have pervious surfaces on the street, primarily because of maintenance. A lot of buses, et cetera, come through this area. Um, but all the runoff is going into these uh, systems and filtering from one one vegetated skirt turb to the next until it gets to the final destination um, uh, and, and, is, and is, is percolating into, into the soil. Uh, so that's how this Green Street is operating. Next. Here are some of the features as they're in building. The gateway is a part of the, uh, of the improvements. Uh, so there's kids that can go across the street and do interpretation, habitat interpretation in the smaller park that's, uh, that's adjacent because the Green Street is adjacent to a 1.4 acre park linear park, the only one of the few stops along the Bionic Creek bike path. And I think the next slide shows some of the pictures of the pull-off area off of the creek. Um, it also uh, has interpretive uh, locations for kids to go and take a look at, Gabby on walls for habitat value as well as dealing with water. Uh, the next slide please. A bird viewing area. I think uh, the kids uh, at, at the school sometimes have programming that's brought to them by uh, the folks at MRCA. Um, they have been doing a little stewardship program down there. Um, it's, it's basically a great as, uh, asset to have right in the kids' areas. And I look at the children as our future stewards. We kind of think what we know we're doing, but ultimately they're the ones that will make the decisions that really, uh, you know, we're going to make some decisions for them, but they're going to be making the long-term decisions as we leave things behind. Next slide, please. There's more feel-good pictures, and uh, that's the bird outlook on the you know that that was built, that's covered, that the kids can go to from uh, from their location. Okay, the Baldwin Hills Conservation Program. That is part of our stewardship effort. A lot of what we do is stewardship. Uh, we spoke a lot of time on trying to build the future uh, for for all of us. Um, LA Audubon Society is one of a great partner. Margot Griswold has been uh, fantastic working with us. She has uh, coordinated a lot of work in, in lockstep with our agency through grants. 
to create leaders at the high school level or the Dorsey High School um, or Esperanza School in, in East LA, or um, I think she's even gone even lower to the middle school, Audubon. Um, they've done a lot of great work and what we try to do is migrate it up the system, up the chain uh, and engage West LA College. And so that was a great goal of ours a number of years ago and it came to fruition. Um, while her, her, her organization is teaching a class at West LA College on the Baldwin Hills uh, uh, Conservation Program funded by the Conservancy and the BHRCA and certainly money from the LA Audubon Society. They do restoration work, they do education. Next slide. Um, they manage the greenhouse, native seed collection, native seed propagation. They really work on the tools. Uh, Margo came to me and said, we want to restore the Baldwin Hills and I'll be glad to work with California State Parks and help coordinate. And, but she just said, you know, it's got to be acre by acre most of the time. And, and you know, we're going to do the restoration work on a methodical basis. So we're very happy with the work that she's done and the things that she's taught people. And she's able to now, after doing 12 to 15 years in the Baldwin Hills, point to areas that she has restored using her science and her, her programs. Um, that are in very good, healthy shape. And, you know, we just have to say the proof is in the port pudding and we're happy to have the canvas known as the Baldwin Hills that she's worked on on restoration. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the kids, once again, it's all about teaching them. Next slide. Um, they get to walk through and learn about a pucha cactus. We talk about the cactus rind being gone. Um, you know, one of the goals is to try and bring enough habitat back so that cactus wren can come back. That's a big bird thing, and I'm down with it if we can get it. Next slide, please. The touchy-feely stuff, the kids are doing programs, and here's a drawing of the great bowl above uh, in, in Kenny Hawn Park that has uh, a habitat value, you know, some sycamores, uh, some oaks, and a lot of red-tailed hawks, and, and they feed on the gophers, and so they did a, a bird's eye view, or red-tailed hawks view, of the uh, of the bowl and the habitat and and the whole biosystem in terms of you know everybody who's eating when and, and who's digging what and who what what lives where. Um, next slide, please. They also create homes, um, you know, owl homes, birds homes, lizard homes. You know, it, it doesn't look natural, but you know they do the craft work and they get it out there and they understand that they're trying to build habitat. And the next slide, please. And here are some of the kids. These are the kids that'll be running stuff when I go away, for sure. I, I think all these kids are gonna have more knowledge of what's going on on the ground and be certainly better stewards than I was raised at that age. And hopefully it, it captures a part of their heart and continues moving forward. Next slide, please. I'm gonna move a little quicker. Uh, bio, the biology update, the biota update was done uh, by USC, our friend Travis Longcore. Uh, did a, a, a pretty good job getting into the dirt um, and, and managing to, to do um, quadrant by quadrant scale um, mapping with Ariel um, and, and address some of the issues and collect some of the data that's necessary to know what habitat is in the Baldwin Hills. It's an update of our last biota study, which was done in 2002 or 2003. Um, and he also developed tools online, which are pretty good for citizen science. The next slide. Um, so he categorized all the habitat types, um, used the aerial photo, photos and footage, and then went on site into areas that were accessible uh, and, and put all that into multiple layers in GIS. Next slide, please. Um, it was a long and arduous thing. Uh, he got into parts of the oil field. He got in near the cemetery, uh, but they did uh, a great, great job. Um, let's see, next up, please. One of the things that I found interesting is that, you know, he, we had never documented the Western skink being in the Baldwin Hills. It was an exciting discovery. Um, it, it, it was just strange to find it, but somehow it's in, it's in Palos Verdes, and, but it showed up in the Baldwin Hills. Um, and uh, it, it's, it was on the soccer corridor of all places, which is a you know, well-traveled corridor. So they're survivors and they're pretty good looking uh, species. And we're hoping that we can see some of them cross back and forth as well. Um, there's a citizen science component. That's the next, next slide. And, and it, there's a lot of sightings, there's a lot of stewards out there that we just, you know, we don't get to see. 
but they're out there and they're doing their thing and they're logging. And a lot of this data is being uh, taken care of or managed by uh, oh, Travis Longcore and, uh, and the portal that they manage uh, through USC. And one of the next slide, the next slide shows the Baldwin Hills Nature at bhc.gov. Um, and that is a lot of the information that uh, was gathered and put together for use for students uh, and for anyone who wants to know, uh, you know, what they found in the Baldwin Hills uh, in terms of the wildlife, geology, the birds, the, yeah, everything's in there. Um, and then there's also the links to iNaturalist for citizen science. That ends my portion. More importantly, you know, I think we've been lucky to have um, the Nature Conservancy uh, in our corner. Um, they've been to Sacramento a number of times. I don't particularly like going to Sacramento. Um, I'll go when they call me, uh, but I like staying local. Um, but it's good to have folks that uh, are in your corner. Certainly, we've had support from our legislators, whether it's Sydney Conlager Dove, who's authoring this new legislation, or uh, Senator uh, Holly Mitchell, who's uh, certainly working at the budget. And with that, I'm going to turn over to our, our, our advocate, Ms. Shona Ganguly. Thank you. Great presentation. Um, you know, I think I think the the slides that you've seen and the presentation you've heard so far from David illustrate the great work that the Baldwin Hills Conservancy has done and invested in, and that that the opportunity that exists to um, to support a conservancy like the Baldwin Hills Conservancy, um, and so I just uh, want to give you a sense of why why the Nature Conservancy is working in this space. Uh, for those who are not as familiar with the Nature Conservancy, even though this is a Sierra Club call, call partially, you know, I, I wouldn't, I would um, be surprised, but still we're um, an international conservation organization, a science-based organization. Uh, we're now based in 79 countries um, and all 50 states in the US. So, my role is in, our, in the policy arena, and um, I work at, on local, state, and federal leg legislative outreach, um, and, uh, and I support our conservation programs work. Our urban conservation program, um, and some of you who are on this call are very familiar with that program, uh, has, has looked at, um, at the biodiversity potential and um, in in the greater Los Angeles region. And what we found is that there's not only a lot of potential, but a lot of biodiversity here in this Mediterranean climate region, one of only five on earth. And um, and what we found is that, that it's really critical that we invest in parks and open space, particularly in areas of historic and dis uh, disinvestment, because there's an opportunity to see a big change in biodiversity in those areas and help provide access to communities who have historically not had ask access. Um, that there, there are projects that, that support watershed protection and restoration um, that, that, that are one's project that Baldwin Hills Conservancy has invested in, native, native habitat enhancement, and again, like I said, more resources for disadvantaged communities. So our BILA work with um, the Natural History Museum, who Travis already mentioned, some of the team members from the Natural History Museum. Um, so the Nature Conservancy's scientists uh, and the Natural History Museum together developed something called the Biodiversity Analysis in Los Angeles tool or project. Um, and it, this is the team. It took a lot of work and, and a lot of time to come up with with this, this analysis, um, we also had a National Park Service Technical Assistance um, Grant. We worked with, uh, with stakeholder groups to get input on, on how, what would be most useful, how we can make sure that this is applied um, and truly represents the region. Um, you know, tra traditional conservation planning often will gray out urban areas. But we know that urban areas have a lot of biodiversity. They have, it has nature and species. And, and so we need to understand that more. And there are folks like Travis um, who have looked at the historical ecology of, of this area and really understand that. Um, so we, we wanted to, to add to that body of work. 
Um, and the other reason we know that there's biodiversity, that there are species here, is because of iNaturalist. We, you know, citizen or community science shows us that there are multiple species um, spread across the region. So um, we developed something called a biodiversity relevant urban typology in this analysis. And that basically means it, it captures the diverse configurations of, of factors such as biophysical conditions, built environment, social structure that affect urban biodiversity. Um, our study area is this greater Los Angeles region. Uh, we did not include with the mountains because there's been so much work and focus on the mountains. Um, we wanted to focus on the area that it has historically not been, had as much study around it. Um, we looked at 6,040 block groups. Uh, these are census block groups. We looked at these 18 input variables and everything from temperature to traffic to um, percentage of urban areas, open space, greenness, you name it. And these, this was based on sort of the data sets we could find or that were apl applicable and also that made sense for the three categories we were looking at. Um, and then we found that there were species or urban um, di different types uh, a species found in every type. So even though you had a type that was like the furthest away from regional parks, for example, you still found 61 species in that area. So an area that's, say, has more concrete, for example, people will say, oh, there's no species there, but there are. Um, so these are the urban types that we found, everything from low development with natural, natural vegetation to, you know, foothill areas, urban parks, less developed, more developed areas, arterials, the, where the freeways are. Um, the other, so th that what we did was we mapped that and you can see the diversity of types. You can also see the areas that are, you know, that have less natural areas, um, the basin in particular, and that those are the areas that probably need more investment. Um, and this is this is overlaid with the state assembly districts, which is important in this case because we're going to be looking at legislation that affects um, Assemblymember Kamlager's district. And then we have um, so that's that's the our bylo work basically showed us that we need to invest more in this space. Um, and we don't I don't just mean the Nature Conservancy. I mean the state, um, you know, our local our local measures and even federal. We even need to invest federal dollars here um, on biodiversity enhancement, habitat enhancement projects. Um, so with Baldwin Hills Conservancy, we um, basically imagined what would be the best case scenario in terms of an expansion um, of the conservancy that would allow, uh, allow Baldwin Hills Conservancy to do more of its good work. And so what we, we came up with is this Baldwin Hills and Urban Watersheds Conservancy. Um, it expands the boundary and also removes the sunset for the conservancy. And Assemblymember Kalmager has uh, introduced the bill earlier this year. Um, it was moving forward with lots of support, um, but of course, because of the pandemic, nothing, it's not business as usual. And it is likely that this, this bill will not, will be put on hold and we'll see it come back next session because the focus in, the, um, in Sacramento right now is really on COVID response and then to some degree thinking about fire preparedness um, and jobs, of course. So there, that's um, why AB 3256 from Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia and SB 45 from Senator Ben Allen are on here. The, they are the authors of potential climate resilience bonds. Those may or may not go forward, but if the Baldwin Hills Conservancy expands, they will have a new funding source potentially from these climate resilience bonds that have money for a whole range of um, investments. And I can, you know, you can look up these bonds um, on the Ledge Info uh, website to see more of the details. I don't want to take up too much of your time now, but if they don't go forward uh, this November, they will hopefully go forward in 2022. If one does go forward this in November, it will likely have more jobs and more fire preparedness in it, like I said. Um, so I already talked about some of this, um, the, that the bill would expand. Um, it, the area would, that would be covered would be the Southern Bayona Creek watershed um, and the Dominguez, uh, Upper Dominguez Channel. Um, 
and it would rename the conservancy, it would repeal the sunset date, and it would change the voting membership of the board um, and expand the non-voting membership. Um, and it would require the entire area be managed for optimum climate resilience. Um, the bill also requires that the Conservancy carry out projects and activities to further the purposes of the act, to study the potential environmental and recreational uses of the Baldwin Hills, Southern Bayona Creek watershed and upper Dominguez Channel area and develop a proposed watershed and open space plan for improvements in the Conservancy territory. Um, and the, the bill would also require that the Conservancy administer any funds appropriated to it for the purposes, um, for these purposes from any future bond act or local initiative measure. Basically what that means is that folks in this territory will be eligible to apply for funding from the Baldwin Hills Conservancy to do projects that enhance and restore nature um, and invest in our watersheds. So finally, um, this this last one talks about the the climate change adaptation improvements um, that to protect conserve and restore the health and resilience of the watersheds and communities of the region all of those are good things we want all of those things so this is the um, proposed expansion area the area in um, in yellowish orange that I'm outlining right now is the current Baldwin Hills Conservancy. The area that is in sort of green um, that I'm outlining would be the um, would be the expanded territory. And this is based on hydrologic unit codes. Um, it's not arbitrary. We wanted it to be watershed based so it can be defensible at the state level. And also we wanted to be respectful of the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy's jurisdictions. Um, this is a zoomed in area because I know the folks on this call are, are interested in the Biona um, Biona Creek watershed and the area that is included there. So here you can see Biona Creek, up here is Marina del Rey. And these slides will be available to you so you'll be able to, to look at them later. Um, and that's it. And I'm sure, David, I missed some things, so please jump in. Um, and if folks have questions, let us know. But, um, we, you know, the Nature Conservancy is here to support this process. Uh, we think it's really important to invest in urban parks and open space and in enhancing um, nature and, in, and utilizing nature-based solutions for other purposes, for stormwater and um, and, and a host of other things like reducing urban heat island effect, improving our air quality, you name it. So we're here as partners to the Baldwin Hills Conservancy and to all of you. Thank you for your time. So David, you wanna, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm just kind of glancing through some of the questions and trying to field some of those and certainly I would take any assistance from uh, uh, Richard if he has anything that he wants to share. Um, bottom line, you know, the opportunities to, to work in the area, I think would be considered uh, a great. Um, uh, we can't project out how things will look in terms of the legislative session, um, nor can we, so that, you know, leaves us hanging in the balance as well as uh, the, the resiliency bonds hanging in the balance. Uh, the timing of this is, like I said, uh, pushed out likely more than anything else. Um, in the long run, we have, uh, I think we have something that's a pretty, that, that can be looked at as a, as a great opportunity. I think people uh, could debate the, what a conservancy does but our agency does a lot of work, very, very laissez-faire in terms of with a light touch. We, we, we build, we buy, um, and, and, and we let other people manage and operate. Um, and that's a model that is, is leaner and meaner um, than trying to have our own army of, of operators to deal with the management of property. Um, and uh, we cannot in the imminent domain, so it makes things uh, very, very easy on that level. Um, I think Shona's answering the questions directly on 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 the email on the chat room. Um, the question about would oil fill fit into this? I think it, 
if that's a question, it, it fits into it in terms of it is the it is the largest urban oil field in the in, in the Los Angeles, and we are looking to change it into the largest uh, park in of created in the last hundred years. Um, oil drilling is of a fact of life. Uh, we work in concert with uh, the regulatory agencies as well as the county. Uh, I sit on the cap for the CSD. We try and manage oil drilling to the best of our capabilities um, in terms of the public uh, accountability, but that's always a work in progress. Um, so that's how that fits into it. So David and Shona, thank you so much. Uh, you're it, certainly your years of uh, expanding the Baldwin Hills Conservancy and the work you've done to build the uh, conservation issues and uh, work on the environment has been amazing. And it just, this uh, presentation has just brought all of that into focus. And that this extension into all the way to the ocean is uh, certainly interesting to explore in terms of how your ability to fund projects and studies in this area would bring a wealth of information, wealth of support into uh, this area that expands far beyond the Biona wetlands for that matter. It's amazing the extent of what you've got doing. I'm going to unmute people here. It's now eight o'clock. Uh, we'll let this go for a little bit and then I'd like to uh, do a few things before we close the meeting down. So would, this is Ben Hamilton. I would like to uh, congratulate uh, um, the people there, David and others that have worked so hard. You've done a wonderful job. It's amazing. It's amazing what you've accomplished. And uh, we need your energy and expertise on behalf of Biona Wetlands. Hi, David. Thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm Shauna. Um, I, I go to Stoneview like every weekend. I love this place and I love all the things you've been doing, obviously. A lot of people ask me about the bike connectivity from the pedestrian wildlife bridge that's being built right now to Baldwin Hills Scenic Overlook. The bikes will be able to go across the bridge and up to the Stoneview Nature Center. Um, athletic people can ride their bikes up or ride their bikes down. Not so athletic people might have to walk their bikes, uh, but it will be addressed. Um, it, it, was, uh, it was a very sensitive area in terms of the habitat. And so uh, the switchback uh, alternative was created, uh, working with state parks. Might just be the area people have to walk their bikes uh, for that short pit. Is that, is that what you were referring to? Yeah, and is that going to be on the current path? Or there be a connected. Path being made. It will be connected. And thank you for the presentation very much. I thought it was a wonderful presentation, and I'm very glad that things are moving in a terrific direction um, up in the Baldwin Hills and Travis's work and so on. Um, but my question regarding Biona and the mapping is as because this is the first I've seen this mapping, I've delved into the obviously the hydrology of the area and the oversight provided um, in dealing with um, various agencies. And I, this is the first, I've seen a map that you would uh, either add part of area A with um, how many yards on either side of the channel um, and or the Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy has never played any role in the hydrologic unit on Viona. Um, so I'm not sure where that answer comes from, but if we could talk about that at more length later, that would be Jake also with you guys. Who is Jake who? Uh, no, that would be Jake. In other words, it'd be good. That's my... <laughs> Playing here. Oh, It'd be well. Jake. I mean, we can talk about it, David, later at some other time. I don't want to take up a lot of time on this. But this is something that I've worked with the Department of Natural Resources on and, and various uh, uh, yeah. you know, the water agencies. And um, I'm just wondering how that map was drawn that way and, oh, okay. and what I mean, jurisdiction you might or might not have through that area because it's all one hydrologic area. Yeah. 
I mean, look, we didn't draw the lines out of the out of the blue. A lot of this comes from the integrated watershed management district uh, coding, um, and I think a lot of it's based on the way the water flows currently uh, through the urban environment, whether it's the channelized system, et cetera. Uh, decisions were made beyond my level on how the HUCs were drone, drawn. Um, but it, and it, I don't know where Santa Monica Mountains was discussed in, in this. I saw the, the chat, but these are if you if you check with the integrated watershed management uh, 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 and the EWIMPs, um, all of their information mirrors these hydrological unit codes. So that's where it starts. They're the, ones, they're the ones we need to go to then to discuss this in as much as obviously we have the EIRs already done. We know the aquifers underlying. So who is divvying this up is, I guess, our question then. And, and who would we go to is, you're saying, some of the Irwin people. It, yeah, they made these decisions. And I think they've been working on this sort of structure for you know, the last 15 years. But, but so once again. Department of Water Resources is also engaged in this. So that's, that's who we've been, been talking to. OK. So we can talk offline if you have any questions further, yeah. but certainly the, the lines the lines came from the, the, the integrated watershed management group. Okay. Uh, Richard? Yeah. Richard? Yes. This is Joe Young. Yes, Joe. Uh, question oh. about uh, the, uh, the bridge. As the architect, who is the architect for the uh, pedestrian, the wildlife and pedestrian bridge? I know it's being constructed by the Griffith Company. I'm not sure I know who the specific architect is. My guess is that it, it is going, it's a, I think a, like, I don't know the technical name for it, but it's gonna be shipped here pre-built and swung across the, the bridge. So I don't know if it was a design custom architect, but a Griffith Park and Griffith, uh, Griffith Company is the one who contracted for the, uh, for the project. You said that there would be opportunities to walk across at night. And then you also said it would be closed to pedestrians at night. So I'm just wondering how that would work and you know what the space would be for the wildlife that they could cross, but pedestrians couldn't. Um, you know, generally parks have the swing bridges, you know, the swing gates that close. You know, just because you close a park, it's impossible to close Kenny Horn. People go in and go out, even though the swing bridges are there just as the habitat would. So closing it means we're not inviting people to be on the bridge. And if somebody does go on the bridge at night, someone a troll would say, get off. Um, but but there's not gonna be a, 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 an iron clawed, a cl ironclad door that shuts and keeps anything from crossing. It'll basically be your typical gate signage, or gate, gates that, uh, that we use at parks. Okay, thank you for the presentation and especially Welcome and wonderful thanks to Shona and the Nature Conservancy. I know 25 years ago when we were first working to save Biona, a lot of our members who were also supporters of the Nature Conservancy begged the Nature Conservancy to get interested in urban areas. And it was just like a little too early, I guess. But so we're grateful that you're here now and paying lots of attention to LA urban areas. And I'm very, um, thrilled with the idea of the Baldwin Hills Conservancy expanding into more areas that obviously need open space and parks and are very supportive of that. The Sierra Club hasn't taken a position on this bill yet. The Sierra Club is our state legislative committee is working on reviewing it and researching it and so um, there will be opportunities to get information in to the author and the author has said that um, you know, that they are not planning on moving it this year. So we have a little bit of time to on it. So uh, we hope that the Airport Marina Group leadership will work with our Biona committee to, uh, to make sure we get all the right uh, information into our legislative committee. And again, thank you for this presentation. Thank you. Mark, did you have a question? It's a, it's a fascinating vision and uh, it's an ex Expensive vision. I, I just wondered how it came how it came together from from putting Biona into the into it all the way down to Dominguez Creek. It, it's uh, geographically it's it's quite large. 
I'll try and answer that question and we'll try and make it the last question if that's possible. The, the idea for expansion um, really comes from uh, the member Cam Ladder's efforts to green the 54. Certainly Assembly Member Burke uh, has the same uh, concept. Um, communities uh, that you saw in the mapping um, are surrounded by hardscape, uh, whether it's you know oil infrastructure, uh, concrete, um, you know, you name it, the impacts um, are there. And the effort to put a conservancy to give attention locally that hasn't been there in the past is something that, that, that the member was championing. And so the line is drawn as an urban conservancy. And urban conservancies, you know, um, it, most of it's, it, it's, it's going to be impacted areas that have very little access and certainly a smaller voice, the smaller cities. And we're talking about Lenox, uh, Vernon, um, you know, areas that don't generally have a voice. Um, CD9, you know, down on Slauson, you know, areas that have not had a conservancy invest. Um, th those are the places that I really want to spend a lot of time and energy on. I think that's what the member was thinking about. I think the reality that we can bring more access and awareness and stewardship uh, further west as we move towards the Bionna, uh, Bionna wetlands, provide that access, whether it's transportation, bicycle, et cetera. Um, all of those ideas, um, I think, will flow from this, this expansion and the opportunities to invest in areas that haven't had investment is, I think, that's the most exciting part of it. Okay, David, thank you very much. Um, so then, tying up these loose pieces here, um, the Airport Marina Group is also very interested in the uh, development of this idea. And we're exploring AB 2000 and finding what its, uh, what its impact will be on this whole area. And we like the idea of having resources brought into this region to help to develop the environment in urban settings. We have a lot of questions about access. We have a lot of questions about how this impacts uh, the diverse ecosystems and the wildlife, the soil and the soil infrastructures and all of that. So there's a lot to talk about here and we're looking forward to being part of that conversation and to have our voice heard. Thank you, Shona. Thank you, David. Appreciate so much you're taking the time to come here. We look, uh, are your slides uh, going to be available so that if anyone would like to have a copy of them, they might be able to reach out either through us or directly to you? Well, ultimately, I think you just recorded this thing. So you've got the dialogue and the slides because sometimes the slides are just pictures. They don't have much information on them and they need interpretation. So truthfully, I think you're going to be the best access for the, for the, for the recording. Okay, so then to draw this... Uh, meeting to a close. Thanks everyone else for being here. And I'm going to go back, I'm going to be asking uh, Miriam Fonio to close our meeting with a poem from Wendell Berry. And I just want to bring this up. You know, we've had some really interesting meetings recently. We had uh, Jill Stewart's talk about how little we know about the soil. And that was followed up with Margot Griswold's talk about soil infrastructure, soil, subsoil systems, and uh, ecological systems. In the reading of Wendell Berry, here's some really great quotes that he came up with that I think you might find relevant. Um, one of the things he said in this uh, article on uh, getting along with nature is first, the teeming wilderness in topsoil in which worms, bacteria, and other wild creatures are carrying on the fundamental work of decomposition, humus, make, humus making, water storage, and drainage. The wilderness of a healthy soil too complex for human comprehension Mm. can benefit from human care and can deliver incalculable, incalculable benefits in return. I, 
And I return to this concept of the wildness of the soil. And the last thing I'd like to say before I turn this over to Miriam is that another quote, the same attitudes that destroy the wildness in the topsoil will finally destroy it everywhere. Or if everyone has to go to a designated public wilderness for the necessary contact with wildness, then our parks will be no more natural than our cities. Mm. And so to address these issues of how we incorporate environmental infrastructure into our cities, and how we protect the diverse ecosystems in our backyards, I think is something that uh, these quotes address and that we need to have further conversation uh, about as well. So Miriam, would you care to care to take away this, uh, this meeting? Sure. Those Awake by Wendell Berry. When we convene again, to understand the world, the first speaker will again point silently out the window at the hillside in its season, sunlit under the snow, and we will nod silently and silently stand and go. Wendell Berry from Given Poems. Thanks, Miriam. So thanks, everyone. Uh, please continue safely on. Yeah. Protect yourselves and protect one another and protect and preserve the local environment yeah. in our own backyards. Thank you. We'll be drawing this meeting to a close. So we hope that you're all weathering the storm of this pandemic and you're keeping yourself safe, protected, and out of harm's way participate in this presentation. But before we get to David's talk, there's some housekeeping we need to take care of. And I'll try to get through this as quickly as possible. And we appreciate your patience. Second, while the presentation is taking place, um, communication will be taking place through the chat feature. So for anyone not familiar with that chat feature, if you look at the bottom of your screen, there is a chat icon. And if you click on that icon, a chat window will appear to the right of your screen. At the bottom of that screen, you'll see an area that says message. So you type in your message, and then you have to click on the return key of your computer. And the message then will be distributed to everyone in the meeting. So if you wish to ask a question, please use the same procedure. And so that the people giving the talk will be able to identify that you have entered a question, please begin your question with a question mark. So I'm just sending this in now so you can see what this is looking like if you're in your chat. Um, there are also a number of nonverbal responses for you to be able to use during the meeting as well. And one is the reactions feature at the toolbar on the bottom of the screen. You can hit on that and I think you've got either a thumbs up or a clapping. And so you can use that to signify your appreciation of the good work that uh, uh, we're doing here. And then also, if you open at the bottom of the screen, if you open the participants window, that will also be a window that opens on your right. And uh, you click on that icon, the participants uh, icon at the bottom of the screen. At the bottom of the participants screen, there are a number of nonverbal reactions for you to choose from. And these signs will appear next to your participant name in the participant window. So that done, there are a few announcements that I'd like to share. The Airport Marina Group is going to be extending our monthly meetings through at least July, and so we're going to be using this Zoom in format. Um, we've got some exciting conversations getting lined up, and 
as soon as we have tied up all the loose ends to those, we'll be letting you know what's on deck. Um, also, for your information, the Airport Marine Group has kicked off the Getting Along with Nature Literary and Film Society. And we've had a couple of meetings, but it's been primarily just to decide how we're going to be proceeding and moving forward. And we got the name Getting Along with Nature because it is the title of an article or an essay written by Wendell Berry in the book, The, uh, Fi the, Wor the Fire Ending World. And so what we're doing is it's a literary and film society. Uh, once a month, we have a meeting to discuss an essay or a book. And once a month, we get together to discuss a film. We have a film event coming up on Thursday, May 28th. We have secured a limited number of free viewing links for the film. The film is called The Story of Plastic. And this is a documentary that pre uh, presents a cohesive timeline of how we got to our current global plastic pollution crisis and how the oil and gas industry has successfully manipulated the narrative around it. So for anyone who has had a chance to see the film, our group will be hosting a discussion using Zoom. And if you're interested in participating, there are a limited number of free links to the film. So let us know if you're interested by sending us a message in the chat window. So with all of that done, I'd like now to uh, introduce you to David McNeil, who is the executive officer of the Baldwin Hills Conservancy. And uh, I point you towards the uh, bio that we did on the announcement. And just to repeat that, the Baldwin Hills Conservancy operates under the Natural Resources Agency for the state of California. As an executive officer, David oversees long-term acquisition and planned development of approximately two square miles of open space into much needed parkland for urban Southwest Los Angeles County. David has directed expansion and improvement efforts, yielding over, yielding over $50 million in state bond funded projects, resulting in nearly 40 capital improvement projects a 30% increase in public lands in the territory, and dozens of planning, programming, and outreach activities essential to optimizing the management of the unique resources in Baldwin Hills and the Bayona Creek watershed. Efforts are now underway to expand the Baldwin Hills Conservancy to the ocean. And uh, David has invited Shauna Ganguly to assist him this evening. And Shona is the Associate Director of Advocacy and Campaigns for the Nature Conservancy, which is the state uh, run section of the Nature Conservancy in California. And uh, Shauna maneuvers through a terrain of environmental policy in Southern California, and her areas of focus are water, urban conservation, habitat connectivity, county conservation funding, open space protection measures, and campaigns. So thank you, uh, David and Shona, for being here. And with that, I'll turn this over to you and take it away. <laughs> 